So this um, this experiment is called Data and Graphs. Okay, and it's going to be um, two weeks long in the fall and spring semesters, and so this video is um, lecture for the first part. Okay, and then there'll be another video for the second part, and there's also some other videos for um, other things within the experiment, and I'll mention those as we go. So what we have today at the beginning is just a discussion about some changes that might need to occur in your lab manual. We are working on um, updating the lab manual, but in case that hasn't happened yet, um, we need to change some things. On procedure step two, it says use a one centimeter block. It should be a two by four. So you want to scratch that out and say two by four. If it already says two by four, then just go like this for the next few minutes because I'm going to talk about a couple other changes. Step three, you should, it should read something about putting a sticky note at the end of the track where it says 10 centimeters and just tear a sticky note in half and put it in the center of the track, okay, so that the two wheels can go past the sticky note um, without, without touching the sticky note. And then step four, you're going to skip. Again, if your lab manual is updated already, don't skip step, step four. And then five, you want to start your fall 10 centimeters from the sticky note. So the first fall is going to be 10 centimeters uh, from the sticky note. When you're finished with the experiment, please clean up all the equipment. I'd like you to take the cart and turn it upside down so it can't roll and put it on the track. Uh, put the stopwatch on the track, put the, uh, leave the sticky note there, put the bubble level on the track, and what else do we have? We have the vernier caliper, put that on the track, and then put the, the 2x4 block on the track. Um, and then make sure that the track is angled um, like this, where the side closest to the computer is on the back side of the table, and the opposite side of the track is on the, the near side of the table, near to you, away from, uh, from me. As the cart is traveling down the track, it, it'll pick up some speed, and we don't want that cart to hit the bumper at the end of the track. Um, so we'd like you to have your hand down there to catch it, all right? Otherwise, if it hits the bumper, it's probably gonna derail, fall off the track, and it might even fall off the table, and these carts tend to bend if they have that long fall. So if you can help us protect the equipment, okay? Thank you. The empirical derivation. The empirical derivation is the underlying concept for this experiment. In other experiments, we're just going to be given an equation and talk about the theory and then perform an experiment to validate that equation and maybe to ask some deeper questions. This particular experiment, data and graphs, the empirical part means that we're going to take some data not knowing the equation that relates that data. We're going to use that data with plots and analysis and some thinking, trying to process through the things that we do know and looking at this data and how it relates to one another um, graphically. Can we then develop an equation that models the data? Okay, so that's called an empirical derivation or an empirical experiment. Galileo Galilei 1564 to 1642 asked the very question that we're going to be asking today and he actually devised an experiment not too much unlike what we're going to do today to come up with this empirical derivation. So I'd like you to go back in time and consider the environment that he had and what tools he had available to him and then we'll consider the question. So the question that Galileo had, and it's the question that I want you to ask while you're doing this experiment, I want you to ponder this question. What is the relationship between distance of fall and the time of fall for an object that's under the influence of gravity? Another way to state this question is, is displacement proportional to time? Is the distance that the object falls directly related to the time. And we'd write that this way. Is D proportional to T? I'm not sure if you can see it when it's written that small. Is D proportional to T? That's our question. 
The symbol alpha, it kind of looks like an alpha, but technically it's not, it's just similar. That symbol means proportionality. Is D proportional to T? If this were true, we would put D, distance or displacement, in meters on this axis, the vertical axis. And on the horizontal axis, we'd put T, or time. If these are directly proportional to one another for an object under the influence of gravity, we should get a straight line. If you double one of the measurements time, the distance will also double. If you triple one, the other should also triple. It's of the form y is equal to m times x, the standard equation of a line. Now maybe you've read ahead a little bit and you know that when you plot this displacement in time, you actually get a sh data that looks kind of like this. It doesn't quite look linear. If it's linear, then it's proportional. There's a linear relationship. But if we take this data, displacement and time, for an object under the influence of gravity, and find that it is not linear, then we're going to have to make further discoveries. Remember that Galileo was asking these questions. And I asked you to take yourself back to that time period and what did he have available to him? He's going to have to measure distance and he's going to have to measure time. What did he have for a timing method? Think back. The 1500s, the 1600s. Do you think he had a Casio watch? I don't think so. Some of you may have thought, you know, Galileo had a heartbeat. And maybe he used his heart. Check your pulse right now. And I just happen to have a ball. And I'm going to drop this ball, and I'd like you to time with your pulse how long until it hits the ground. So you're going to have to listen well, because um, you're not going to see this hit the ground. Three, two, one, go. Did you hear that? So how many heartbeats was that? Was that one or two? Do you think it's consistent? Let's, let's check this. Three, two, one, go. Bonk. Bonk. Where did I come up with that? Was it about the same number of beats? How many did you get? One beat? Two beats? I got about seven. No, I'm kidding. Um, do you see a problem, though, with taking your pulse to get a measurement? One of the problems might be resolution. How many of you counted 1.296 beats of your heart? Probably nobody. We can't resolve the beats of a heart beyond just simply counting them. Integers. We can't get to a tenth of a beat. So that's one problem. We call that the precision or the resolution of the measurement. Another problem you may have thought about is Galileo, he's doing this experiment and, well, he's a scientist, so he's getting excited as data's coming in and, and his heart rate might change which is going to affect the data collection. So what other methods were available? Ah, some of you may have been thinking about a sundial. Is that very effective in this experiment? Are you ready? Three, two, one, go. How much did that shadow change on the sundial? Oh, okay, I see. We're going to go to the top of some big, huge cliff. And, and drop the ball and yell at someone, okay, I'm starting now, and then drop the ball. And... No, I don't think the sundial is going to work too well. But we're working with the timing methods that were available to Galileo. So what other kind of clocks were available to Galileo in his time period? Ah, maybe you've thought of this one. An hourglass, sand in the glass, and... You start the experiment, okay, ready, set, go, and then turn it over and, well, I got three grains of sand. That might be hard also. Again, we're not resolving well enough. Do you all know what he used? Here's a picture, a depiction of an early water clock. Galileo actually used a water clock. That's how he made his measurements. He had a, a vat of water and he had poked a hole in the bottom of it, and then he had some sort of cup, and he would start the experiment. 
So maybe he had someone working with him. Three, two, one, go. And the ball would be released and water would be collected. When the experiment was over, stop up the hole, move the cup over to the side, mark it, and then another cup and repeat the experiment. So when you're done with the experiment and you have your different displacements, you could compare the different amounts of water, just compare the masses. And those are all related to one another, just as time would be. Think about it. That's a pretty decent clock for this experiment. Except we have another problem. Have you thought about it? There's another problem that Galileo had. Have you thought about it? Has it crossed your mind that, that there was a real issue with, with dropping this object, even with a water clock? See, I'm going to hold my finger over the water dripping and say, three, two, one, go, and stop. The experiment happens very, very quickly. And you can imagine as this distance gets shorter, the time is less and less. This ball is just moving through space quicker and quicker and quicker. Oh, we're kind of giving away some of the answer about the relationship for, between displacement and time. If you did an experiment where you had a block on a horizontal surface and you let go of the block, the experiment, well, it'd be boring. In this experiment, it's like the one we've been doing with this ball. You've got vertical motion, and there's just too much motion too quick. So how do you think Galileo compromised? It's kind of in the title of the experiment. Data and graphs, an inclined plane. With the inclined plane, you're just using a, a portion of gravity. Here, you're using all of gravity, and here, you're using none of gravity. It's not going to move on its own. Here, you're using some fraction of gravity. So we go from none of gravity to all of gravity. Between the incline and the table, there's an angle. And we could call that angle theta. Do you think there's some relationship between theta and the amount that gravity is influencing this object as it slides down the incline? Let's think back a little bit to trigonometry. Do you remember that class? I want you to think what kind of function would go from 0 to 1 as the angle theta changes. So as this angle right here increases, starts out at 0 and increases to 90 degrees, what trig function will take that angle and the answer will go from 0 to 1? In other words, all of gravity and here we have none of gravity. Have you thought about it? The sine of theta. Think about it. The sine of 0 degrees is 0, and the sine of 90 degrees is 1. So the sine of this angle is going to give us the component of gravity that's acting along the incline. What is the sine of theta? We have here a block. We're going to use a 2 by 4, and that has a particular height. We're going to find that height with a vernier caliper. And then we have some distance L here. It's a length. It's the distance between the supports on the incline. How do we describe the sine of this angle theta? Do you remember the rules for sine theta? It's opposite over hypotenuse. So it's simply equal to H over L. The height over the length. That's sine theta. What are the units for sine theta? Think carefully. If we measure h in centimeters and l in centimeters, then what are the units of sine theta? Sine theta is dimensionless. So again, one of your jobs is going to be to quantify h and l so that you can find sine theta. Sine theta has something to do with this experiment. We're sure of it because we have um, all of gravity, none of gravity, but instead we're going to set up an incline. We're going to have some portion of gravity. So we'd like to know what that sine theta is relating H and L. Again, you're going to measure the H 
with a vernier caliper. And you're going to measure L with a meter stick that's actually embedded on the track itself. There's a video that describes the measurements that you're going to take. It's different than this video, and it'd be a good idea to watch that one. Do you remember the three questions that you ask with every measurement? The first question is resolution. That first question of resolution is really answering, uh, is answered by the standard and by the unit of measure. The scale factor that's on your standard is going to answer the question of resolution or the precision. It's oftentimes uh, referred to as the readability of the instrument. That precision or readability in the instrument might be too fine for the procedure that's being used to take the measurement. Something that gets in the way is parallax, and you'll see that in this experiment. The other video that talks about the measurements will talk about the parallax. When you apply your procedure to the measurement, you might increase the uncertainties. In other words, your confidence factor might go down, your uncertainties might get larger. And then finally, you have repetition available to you. This is not the case with every measurement, but there are some measurements, and we'll have one in this experiment, it's the timing measurement, where the resolution and the procedure both do not lend themselves well to uncertainties because the confidence factor goes so far down that we have little confidence in our uncertainties. So we employ the third question of uncertainties, and that is repetition. You take the same measurement over and over and over again, and see how consistent that measurement is, or how much wiggle is there in that measurement. We're expecting this every single time, but sometimes we get this and sometimes we get that, and so there seems to be this range that we get. How do we quantify that range? So remember, there are three base questions that we can ask when we take a measurement. The first always is looking at the instrument that we're using. What is its resolution, its precision? What is its readability? And the second question we ask is, when I interact with this measurement, when I interface this measurement with the object, is there some more uncertainty that enters in to the measurement? That procedure of measurement, that method of measurement, that interaction or that interface. And then thirdly, that repetition. When I repeat the measurement over and over and over again, do I see a consistent measurement and how much spread do I see in all the data? Now, when it comes to a standard deviation, the standard deviation is answering that question of, of spread in the data. The standard deviation is a statistical function. It's often represented with the bell curve. This bell curve shows a spread in data. Well, right here we have the, the mean data point where most of the data seem to settle right around that mean. The standard deviation is going to tell you from that mean value, how far out will all the, well not all the data, but about two-thirds, about 68%, how far from the mean will 68% of the data lie? How big are those bars? For example, if we say our measurement was 3.40 centimeters and our uncertainty from the standard deviation, that statistical formulation, is 0.04 centimeters, what we're saying is that 68% of all the data that we took is going to fall between 3.36 centimeters and 3.44 centimeters. So if your standard deviation is smaller, it means it's tighter and more of uh, two-thirds of the data is going to fall very close to the mean value. But if your standard deviation is large, 68% of the data is going to be sitting further away from the mean. Oftentimes, we'll talk about one, two, or three standard deviations. When we talk about going out one standard deviation from the mean, it's going to include about 68% of all the data taken. If we go out two standard deviations, so one, two standard deviations, we're going to incorporate, of all the data, about 95%. And if we go out to three standard deviations, of all the data that we took, 99.7% is going to lie within three standard deviations of the mean. 
The standard deviation formula, again, is going to answer how big are the bars that surround the mean value, plus or minus how much will 68% of all the data lie? Do our measurements allow a very close, narrow standard deviation or a wide, a large standard deviation? How big is this? The standard deviation often represented with sigma about the mean, x with a bar over it is considered the mean value of x. x is all the measurements that we took and the mean value. The standard deviation is a measurement from the mean. We have a summation in the numerator. In the denominator, we have number of data points minus 1. The counter of the summation is from 1 to n. We take the mean value and we subtract from it one of the data points. We take that difference and square it. Then we take the mean value and subtract the next data point. Take that difference and square it. We add all those squares up for all the differences between the mean and the individual data points. Once all those are summed up, we divide by n minus 1, and then that whole fraction, we take the square root. That becomes the standard deviation. And it's normally reported with the mean value. So I would say that my measurement, x in this case, is equal to the mean value plus or minus the standard deviation. Or I could report it this way. The mean value plus or minus the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean. And then we could also multiply this value times 100% to give this uncertainty a percentage. In this first example, the standard deviation has units. The units of the standard deviation match that of the mean value. So we call this a measurement uncertainty found by method of standard deviation. In this example, our uncertainty is called a relative uncertainty. It's relating the uncertainty to the measurement. We'll get more into that analysis of uncertainties in the second part of the experiment, in the spring and fall, that's, that's week two. Just a note real quick about this experiment. There is another video that goes through and talks about the procedure. But you're going to start the cart at a certain position. It's pretty close. It's about 10 centimeters from your final mark. And you're going to drop the cart three times. And then you're going to move the card up 10 centimeters and drop it three times from there. Move the card up and drop it three times from there. So each time your displacement is getting further and further and further. Don't forget the question that we're asking along with Galileo. How are displacement and time related to one another for an object under the fractional influence of gravity? Fractional because we've set up an incline. We have some angle theta between the table and the incline. And we've already evaluated how to measure or calculate sine of theta from a measurement of height and distance between supports. That ratio will give us sine theta. There are some other videos that you should watch, hopefully before class. If you didn't, you might want to watch them in class. There's a video about the procedure and the equipment. There's another video about the procedure and the uncertainties. Every time when you take your measurements, you want to be careful to discover the uncertainties while you're taking the measurement. And then finally, there's a, a video or two actually on the vernier caliper um, on how to employ that for this experiment. Your homework. There's something you should know, though. There's a, there's a column in the far right of your data table, and it's titled something like predicted displacement or theoretical distance or something like that. And most of it is grayed out. You're not to fill that in. 
That's going to come in, in in week two in the second part. The only way that we can predict the displacement is if we've already empirically derived the formula for the displacement. Remember, that's our goal. We do not know how displacement and time are related. We're simply trying to find that relationship with data. After you get your first set of data today, um, displacement versus time, and I'd like you to clip that out as, as quickly as you can. Uh, by clip, I mean just clipping along, okay? Do this quickly. Set up jobs for each person in your group and stick to those jobs. One person is in charge of recording all the data, and y'all can copy that data later on. Once you're done with displacement versus time, I'd like you to set up a plot. Uh, displacement versus time. Displacement is on the Y, time is on the X and label the axes, displacement measured in meters, and time measured in seconds. Don't make a plot that's a microfish, okay? Spread out your time axis, spread out your displacement axis. These don't have to be, and they should not be, a one-to-one -one relationship. Our displacement is gonna be a different scale than our time, but I want you to spread out the time as much as you can, and the displacement as much as you can, and then plot the data. You're going to have plenty of data points, and when you're done, you should find that the data points go something like this. It appears to be a curve. Interesting, isn't it? And you need to write that conclusion on the plot. You need to show that, boy, this data looks like it's curved. It does not look proportional. And you should write that down right on the plot. Because remember, we're trying to solve this empirically. This being what? How are displacement and time related to one another? Are they directly proportional? And if your data is curved, then the answer has to be no, they're not directly proportional. And you may even write something else on that plot. You may say something like, it kind of looks quadratic. It almost looks like a parabola. Now, when you get your data points, what I'd like you to try is take your paper and Orient the paper such that you can test the, um, the elbow parabola. Your elbow can actually trace out the parabola pretty nicely. Let me show you what I mean. If you position the elbow just right, and then you just simply swipe the paper when you put the pen down, practice a few times, like a golf swing, you're practicing, and then just simply drop your pen down and swipe. Oops, I hit it with my elbow. Let me try this again. You see how smooth that curve is? But whatever you do, do not take a straight edge to this data and draw a straight line. Don't do that. If you draw a straight line, you're saying a couple things. One, you don't know the curve when you see it. And two, that displacement and time are directly proportional. They're not. We should know that from simply dropping objects all our lives, we know that the more time that goes on, the faster this ball is moving. And if it's moving faster, then displacement is changing in a way that is not linear to time. If D versus T appears to be quadratic, that means that D is not proportional to T. But it also means that if we square time, if it is a quadratic, if we square the time, then we might see something that is proportional. So why not try it? Take all your time values and square them and make a new plot, D versus T squared. Now this is the plot that I want you to be very, very careful. D versus T was just kind of a look-see that, oh, look, it's not straight, it's curved, it looks parabolic. D versus T squared, on the other hand, we're going to do all our analysis. We're actually going to use the plot D versus T squared to find G, the acceleration due to gravity. So we want to pay careful attention to this plot. Again, stretch out the T squared axis carefully. Know what, have a zero point, and then know how far out you need to go to get your last T squared. Square, stretch out your displacement. That shouldn't be too hard because you've already made a plot where you stretched it out. You can use that same scale. But remember that we want to see an origin, a zero, zero, on your paper. On your plot of D versus T squared, Q 
carefully plot every single data point. After you have your data, we want to somehow draw a best fit line. The best fit line requires some, some guidance. Later in the semester, we'll use a computer to find the best fit line. It's using a method called least squares fit, or linear regression. And a computer can find it like this, it being the slope and the intercept, and oftentimes even a reporting on the uncertainties. But we don't have that luxury with this first experiment. It's the belief of this department that the first real data taking experiment that you have, you're gonna tabulate all the data by hand and you're gonna make the plots by hand. No computer generated plots are allowed for this experiment. We really want you to ax to the grindstone, figure out how to draw these points and figure out how to make these scales and figure out how to draw that best fit line. I'm gonna give you some pointers, some things you need to, to um, to keep in mind when you're drawing that best fit line. Rule number one, the line does not need to go through the origin. And in fact, we will say that it probably will never go through the origin. So that's rule number one. Don't force your line through the origin. Point number two, the line does not need to touch any data point. Yes, I'm serious. The line does not need to touch any data point. And rule number three. Rule number three is the hardest to, to comprehend, but it's the most intuitive of the three rules. The line should balance the weight of data above and below the line. Now, I didn't say count the number of data points above and below and make them match. No, instead, we want the spread that the data is from the line to match above and below. So in other words, if we have one data point that's way up here, we'll want to match that with three other data points below the line that their spacing from the line adds up to be this spacing above the line. Kind of confusing, but it kind of makes sense. Now, is there a trick to drawing this line, kind of like the elbow curve? That are, there actually is. What I'd like you to do with your paper, after you've drawn the plot and you have the origin on your paper, I'd like you to take the paper with the origin towards your, your nose and then close one eye and look down the data line, the line that you haven't drawn yet. And your mind's eye will actually show you a pretty decent look at the least squares fit, at the linear regression. You'll be able to see it. But now the trick is throwing your paper down on the table and drawing it real quickly. Okay, so then it's kind of handy to have a transparent ruler or a ruler set on its, on its edge instead of flat. Because then you can try to balance the weight of the data above and below the line. That spacing, that separation that the data is from the line above and below. Trying to minimize that spacing and average it. There is another method that you can employ to find the best fit line by hand, and that is to average all the displacements and average all the time squares. Come up with the data value. Average displacement for the y and um, average time squared for the x. And then plot that xy data point. So there's my average t squared comma average displacement. And then, take one of the high data points and draw error bars. What do I mean by error bars? Well, your displacement was a measurement. It had to have uncertainties. So find out how big those uncertainties were. Oh, I should say it this way, because it's displacement. And draw error bars vertically. And then do the same for the x. Draw error bars. So in this case, I made my error bars in the x, or the t squared, bigger than I made my displacement error bars. And then do the same thing for a low value data point. And now you can draw two lines. One of the lines goes from the extreme on the first data point, and it has to go through the average and go to the opposite extreme for the other data point. And by extreme, I mean the outside of the error bars. 
Let's, I have to <laughs> position myself so I can see this line well. This line is difficult. Oh, sorry. Kind of hard to make when I'm not at the right height here. And then this one will go up something like that. Now, of course, you will calculate average values for average t-squared and displacement, and you will simply use a straight edge. Your plot will look much more methodical. And those are perfectly straight, I hope you can see. <laughs> and what have we just done is we've just shown the extremes of the best fit line. So how do you think we could find the best fit line? Aha. Uh -huh. We simply bisect this angle. We draw a line that averages those two extremes. So that's a different method. You can try either one. Whichever method you employ, I want you to take that line and then describe that line with an equation. To do that, you're going to have to calculate the slope of that line. And you're going to have to either calculate or estimate the y-intercept. The way I want you to calculate the slope I want you to do it very purposefully and show the work. I want you to draw the triangle. To get the two points of your triangle, I want you to find where your line goes through a grid crossing. Hopefully it does. And hopefully your line goes through a grid crossing in two different places. When you find this slope, don't you dare use two data points. In fact, I kind of wish that we were doing this experiment on paper with transparency. And one layer of transparency would have the data points. And then the next layer would have the best fit line. And then we take the data points and remove them so that we just have the line sitting on the grid. Because it's that line we want to find the slope for. So do not use the data points when you draw this triangle. Hopefully you can find where the line goes through the grid. Why do we want through the grid crossing? Because the grid crossing has a definite scale. There's no uncertainty where, where that point is. Show the delta D, and by delta I mean capital delta, the difference in displacement from here to here. And show the delta T squared. What is T squared minus T squared? That's going to give you rise over run. That's your slope. Write it out. Delta D over delta T squared. And show the result. And don't forget the units. You've got meters on the Y, and you've got seconds squared on the X. Meters per second squared. And then you need to highlight the, the Y intercept. What is its value? Now you can either estimate it or you can calculate it using point slope form. Once you've done that, you can write out the equation. This equation is going to describe your data from your experiment. Look at the equation form. D displacement is equal to some slope value that you're going to discover with units of meters per second squared multiplied by T squared plus your y-intercept measured in meters. And so you'll have a decimal value here and a decimal value here. And you could call this displacement from my measurement or displacement from my experiment. This is the model. You could use this model to predict how far away things will be in a certain amount of time for your particular incline. Now this slide is just a little bit of a preview of what we'll be looking at in the second half of the experiment, evaluating the uncertainties and the, the error propagation. So what's due next week? Between the first week of experiment and the second week of experiment, you've got some homework, some stuff you have to do on your own to come back with the second week. You need to prepare two plots. One is a quick plot. It's D versus T. And don't forget, you need to have some text on there that explains whether or not this data looks proportional. And if you can, do a little parabolic elbow curve okay, on there. But don't you dare put a straight line on D versus T. 
The second plot you need is D versus T squared. And that's the plot that I want you to belabor. Take some time with that plot. Again, these plots need to be done by hand. And you need to draw the best fit line on the data and find the equation of the line and represent it with proper units. That's the assignment to have completed before you come into class next week. Everybody at your table is going to have a line that's slightly different, but you have the same data. And so it'll be a nice experiment or observation next week when you come in. Everybody at your table gets to compare lines. You get to compare slopes and compare intercepts. So let's not forget Galileo's question. How are displacement and time related for an object that's under the influence of gravity? Are they directly proportional? Are they proportional when you square the time? What is the relationship between displacement and time? That's what we're trying to find empirically. Taking some data, making some plots. In part two of the experiment, we're actually going to explore how do we now, with this knowledge that displacement is directly proportional to time squared, how do we take that knowledge and turn that into a generalized equation? A model that is more universal than just our particular incline. How could we write an equation that we could send to other people and say, you build your own incline, and if you use this generalized model, you'll discover how your data is going to behave an empirical derivation.